Let's take our Bibles and look in Ezekiel chapter 17. And I'm going to finish reading in this chapter that we started last time, beginning with verse 19 down to verse 24. We saw last time how the Lord had warned that even though Zedekiah, who was the last king of Judah, put in place by Nebuchadnezzar, thought that somehow he could turn things around by an alliance with Egypt. And yet the Lord showed himself that he was indeed the king of kings and lord of lords. And a good reminder for our day, it's the Lord that puts up kings, it's the Lord that sets them down, blessed be the name of the Lord. So we pick up with the rest of the story here with Zedekiah, again the last king of Judah. He had been put there as a puppet king by Nebuchadnezzar. Jehoiakim, the one before him, had been removed by Nebuchadnezzar and now Zedekiah. So here in verses 19 to 21, in Ezekiel 17, if you found your place, we see the exact detail of what would take place just in a short while. Remember Ezekiel was already in exile and he was sending this message back down to those who remained in Judah. So Zedekiah would have still been there, but within a few years, this would come to pass exactly as God determined. That's an amazing thing. Generals put together their armies and they strategize and they try to place people here and there and yet they don't know the outcome of the battle. Here, the Lord not only determined how the battle would fall, but the very outcome of what would happen to Zedekiah. So in Ezekiel 17 and verse 19, we read, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. All the way down through here. Thus saith the Lord God. How do you know it's going to turn out this way? Thus saith the Lord God. As I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised. And here the he goes back up in the context to Zedekiah. That oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him and he shall be taken in my snare. Notice how it's written, in my snare. Who's taking him? It's going to be Babylon. But whose snare is it? God's. And I will bring him to Babylon and will plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed against me. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword. So even that specific detail, how these would die, by the sword. And they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds. And here it is. Ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. So when the Lord speaks here of spreading his net over him. You remember when we were studying Jeremiah. And you can write this in the margin here. Jeremiah 52 verses 6 through 9. We already looked at this. These are parallel. What? Jeremiah prophesied and what Ezekiel is declaring. But there it tells the story of how Zedekiah and some of the other high-ranking men of the government tried to escape whenever Babylon had put a siege around Jerusalem. Reminds me of what the Lord said about the thieves and robbers, the hirelings, that when they see the wolf come, they flee and leave the sheep. Zedekiah and these high-ranking men thought that they would escape out of the city for their lives and leave the rest to the destruction when the Babylonians came against Jerusalem. But they did not succeed. Why didn't they? It wasn't for lack of planning. It was because the Lord himself had spread the net over him. We're not talking about a visible net. And let's remember this even when Certain situations seem impossible to us. Remember, the Lord is directing. 
and uh, he casts that net how he will and entraps people even in their very escape. And so, as it says here, and we read, the Lord said that when Zedekiah had broken his covenant with the king of Babylon, he had made a covenant with the king of Babylon, that he would, he pledged allegiance to him. That's why Babylon, the king put him in power, but he quickly refused to pay tribute and began to look to Egypt for his help. And so, even though he committed that treason against the king of Babylon, here it's the words of the Lord, it was treason against the Lord, Jehovah God himself. And again, Jeremiah had repeatedly advised Zedekiah and the other Judeans that Rather than try to connive or get out of this, they were to surrender themselves to the Babylonians. Why? Because it was God bringing the judgment. So it was a matter of them submitting to God's will in the matter, rather than thinking that somehow they could escape. And that's why in verse 19, the Lord speaks here prophetically to Zedekiah as if, his own oath had been despised. This wasn't just an oath to Nebuchadnezzar that Zedekiah had made, but it was before God himself. That's why the scriptures say that let our words be few and let us not hastily speak an oath before the Lord because he does hold men to it and what they say. I know it's treated lightly today because whenever there's a swearing in, what's, what do the people do? They take a Bible, you swear to tell the truth, hold, hold the truth, so help me God. They, they, it lightly flows out and then they go right online. Don't think that God is not witness. He may not immediately judge in those cases, but men will be caught in their own lies before God, unless the Lord's pleased to be merciful to them. Here, it's not only speaking of Zedekiah, but all his troops that would fall by the sword. And those who remained would be scattered. There would be no recovery from the fall of Zedekiah's reign. I liken this to no recovery from Adam's fall. When Adam fell, his whole race fell in him. That's his representation here. And so Zedekiah, not only there were consequences for his disobedience, but for all those that were under his reign. And therefore, Judea or Judea would be completely conquered. That's what God had purposed. Taken into captivity, and for 70 years, they would remain there. But, as in anything we read here, as stark as these judgments are, and these things did come to pass. We're reading, I know it's called Ezekiel the prophet, but he was prophesying them for his day. But we can learn from this. And here in verses 22 to 24, we have God's promise of restoration. For the 10 tribes of the north, there was no restoration. They were scattered and those tribes are gone. So why the tribe of Judah? Well, we're going to read here why the Lord was merciful. In verse 22 to 24, thus saith the Lord God. This wasn't coming from Ezekiel. He wasn't foreseeing things other than what God revealed. He said, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon an high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, 
and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. So here we see in the form of a proverb or a parable, an image, God promising that he was not finished with Israel or Judah per se. That even though he would take the highest of the branches and would crop them off from the topmost of its young twigs, there would be a tender one that would grow up out of this. And he would replant it on a high and prominent mountain. Well, what's the tender one? Put down Christ in your margin. He would grow up as a seedling, as a root out of a dry ground, even though the Lord would at this time completely devastate that tribe of Judah. Yet he would preserve a tender one, which would be none other than Christ, the Messiah, the son of David. And you can read other portions in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah where that tender one is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why though he would crop off from the top of the royalty of Zedekiah, that, line, that lineage of Zedekiah, yet he said he would take from that top, it's like you, you cut a plant, you save part of it, you take it and you plant it again in another place. Maybe that plant from which you cut it ends up dying or you uproot it, but that little twig that you place and plant, it's, it begins to grow. That's a picture of what God purposed that he would do through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that little word twig there or a sprig, I'm not a gardener, so I'm just... <laughs> Assuming that those are the same thing, but that that links that to the messianic title Given by Isaiah of Christ being the branch So if you want to write a reference to Isaiah 11 1 there and Jeremiah mentioned it in Isaiah 23 5 Actually here in this particular verse three different Hebrew words are used to describe this one Twig. Ezekiel's word refers to the top of the tree. And then the other words describe the shoot coming from the stump, which would be a reference to the line of David. That's why the Lord preserved them, because of God's promise to David. And when he says there in the mountain, verse 23, of the height of Israel will I plant it. Well, he's talking about raising up an entirely different lineage. There was never another actual king that was raised up for Judah, even after the captivity. There was Nehemiah and Ezra, they served as advisors, but never a king. So you say, well, when was this actually accomplished? It's when Christ came of the lineage of David. And that he would appear as a tender plant that is in his incarnation, but he would be high and eminent. That's the word that's used there in verse 22. I will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. And what he would establish then would be his kingdom and would be his church. That's what it's talking about there. And it took place some say, well, that was Jerusalem, but there was a higher mountain than Jerusalem. You remember in Daniel's vision, there was a stone that came down and destroyed that last kingdom, which was Rome. And a mountain was established, a kingdom, as a result of that. Well, that's talking about the kingdom of Christ and the establishment of the final lineage of David. There's no other king that has ever come before him or after since he was established and he was planted there and that was the rod from the stem of Jesse, that branch that came out of its roots. They thought it had been dead as it's described here 
when the Lord said of all the trees of the field, verse 24, shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, that would be with reference to Zedekiah and, and all those kings of Israel, but I have exalted what? The low tree. He grew up as a, a root out of a dry ground and have dried up the green tree. What's that referring to? That's that lineage. We've been studying that all along through the kings, the, the different uh, lineage all the way down to Zedekiah, and now the Lord was drying it up, but what? Have made the dry tree to flourish. How many years went by between Zedekiah and the coming of Christ? Over 500. And during that time, there wasn't a king. And some might think, well, then the promises of God weren't fulfilled. Yes, they were. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law. So after the failure of the two great eagles, remember that's how this whole chapter started, both Babylon and Egypt, that the Lord caused his kingdom to prosper. And that would be 500 some years later. And there it says in verse 23, it refers to it as a, it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar. This could be none other than Christ because he's the only good one. And under him, under this cedar, this tree of life, another way of putting it, Christ, it shall dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. What that, what's that talking about? That's talking about the Lord having come not to just establish a Jewish kingdom. He didn't come to do that, but a kingdom that would be of every tribe, nation, and tongue. And the fowls, they're referring to the birds that would come and dwell underneath. This would extend to all nations. That's how far reaching this tree would be that the Lord would establish. And there it says all the trees of the field shall know what that I the Lord have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree how, how can we have confidence in God's word even as he directs our lives look back in history history his story it's God's history and there has not failed one thing of all that he said should be accomplished he is the creator he's the sustainer He's the judge in the matter of salvation, but also in the matter of condemnation. And uh, he rules from on high. So when you look over history, when it says he brought the high tree down, go back and read history and you'll see that everything that ever was gigantic or in, in stature or colossal in dimensions that men look at, even if they call it the seventh wonder of the world or whatever it is, the Lord has brought it low. But when it says he's exalted the low tree, there are many examples of this in scripture, what he did with Joseph in the dungeon. His brothers thought that they had been rid of him and yet the Lord took him from that and raised him up to rule over his brethren. Israel and Egypt, they were slaves for those 400 plus years and yet in the Lord's time, he brought them forth. Think of Hannah and her prayer to God for a seed. And the Lord, in her lowest state, gave her that seed, which was Samuel. And David, when Saul, Samuel would have passed by him, he was out there taking care of the sheep for his father. And uh, when... Uh, they said, go fetch him. Samuel said, go fetch him. That was to be the Lord's anointed. But you don't have a better example than Christ himself, that root of a dry ground. He humbled himself. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself and took on the form of a man and became as a servant and submitted himself, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So while this chapter that we read here in 17 began with judgment and punishment 
And we see in reading back in history how it was all fulfilled exactly as the Lord said. Yet, here it ends with mercy and grace. The dethroned, remember they killed Zedekiah's sons in front of him and then put out his own eyes. But that dethroned and blind Zedekiah was overshadowed by God's king ruling and reigning from heaven even at that time but then purposed to come to this earth and in him that foundation stone has been laid forever don't ever think of going back everybody still thinks well maybe there's some aspect of Jews history that still hadn't been fulfilled forget it you won't find that in scripture Christ has fulfilled it all and he is that one that the Father has exalted. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. How precious indeed it is when you grant us eyes to see and ears to hear. I pray that you would bless our continuation of this time of worship. We long to see Christ in your word. We long to worship you through him. And you are the one that has given us that desire by your spirit. And so we bless you. Thank you. And uh, pray for your continued blessing. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.